Welcome to the Naples Community Church Podcast with Pastor Kurt Anderson. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you find this sermon inspires you, builds your faith, and gives you perspective to see God moving in your life. We trust God has great things in store for you. Enjoy today's message. Well, Mike Collins, who was in the command module... Well, the other guys got to go down to the moon a a year or 50 years ago. I can't believe it's 50 years ago. Um, Said that when they got back, they traveled all over the world. And wherever they went, people, as they were going through these parades, people were crying out, we did it. We did it. It was like a, uh, a wonderful experience that the whole world participated in the whole world took credit it wasn't we beat those lousy commies you know we did it and there was tremendous unity and 50 years how things have changed i can imagine neil armstrong if he were stepping down on the on the uh, surface of the moon now well here's one step for one who identifies as a male and a giant leap for the global community or something like that. How things have changed. And part of that change is sort of the, the, is the enmity and antipathy that, that we see all around us and we hear so much, not just in news broadcasts, but in table conversations. I was in one yesterday with a woman who works at a bank. She's a Russian a Russian immigrant, I should say, she's an American. And a woman came who was also an American who was from Colombia. And as they were going about this transaction, the Russian woman said that, had a number of questions that she had to ask about the transaction that they were doing. And and the Colombian woman, the woman from Colombia, pardon me, the woman from Colombia said, well, you wouldn't ask those questions if I had blue eyes. You're a racist. And turned her into her boss, and the boss had to report this back to her. I mean, this is the sort of atmosphere, the, 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 the difficulties that we are living with these days. And so I decided this morning I'd preach on something I've never preached on before. And that's 1 Corinthians 13. You've heard it so many times, almost every wedding I've done. Almost every wedding any of us go to, uh, here's this passage. It's almost one of those that as I read it, you're going to be able to follow it along because you've heard it so many times. And, And because we've heard it so many times, sometimes we can miss what it says. And frankly, this is a passage, a text that I could preach several sermons on. I'm going to do my best to cram all kinds of material into one single sermon this morning. But it's the Apostle Paul who understood the realities of divine love. And that divine love, God's love for us, becomes the example of what love is to be amongst one another. Hear the word of God as it comes to us from 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for knowledge, for, as for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. 
When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And that's really what the good news is all about. The Apostle Paul declares that we were enemies of God. All of us. Not just a few of us. Not just the, those who are on the margins. But all of us were enemies of God. And he loved his enemies, us, so much that he sent his son to die for us. So the question is always, why would we not love those whom God loves? Why would we consider with enmity those whom God loves and those whom God is working on to redeem and bring into his family? Now there was a, Arthur Brooks writes about the what was called the mother of all rallies. It was on the mall of Washington, D.C. two years ago this September. And it was a huge rally for, for President Trump. Well, in response to this, Black Lives Matter was going to come down. And there was going to be one of those, they were anticipating one of those times, one of those clashes between the Trump people and the Black Lives Matter people. And so, Huck Newsom, who was the president of Black Lives Matter, came up and he, he stood and looked at Tommy Newsom, who was heading up the, the rally. And he came to fight. Hawk came to fight. Tommy Newsom didn't feel much more warmly toward Hawk as Hawk felt toward him. So we had this, this divide, this this latent conflict ready to unfold. And then Tommy Newsom invited Hawk, pardon me, Tommy Hodges invited Hawk Newsom to come up on stage and to speak to the crowd. And Hawk did. Hawk Newsom got up and he, he addressed the crowd. And he said, I'm a Christian. I'm an American. And he said what he had to say and the crowd loved so much of what he said. They didn't like some of what he said, but he loved, they loved a lot of what he said. And when it was all over with, they realized, these two realized that there was a lot more in common about them than they had anticipated. A couple of weeks ago, I preached a sermon on the prodigal, pardon me, on the uh, Good Samaritan. Let's do a quick redo of that prodigal, of, the, of that parable. Of the, of the Good Samaritan. Let's say that the guy in the ditch is a Black Lives Matter guy. He's got a t-shirt on. Or, or he's got a MAGA hat on. Either one. Doesn't matter. Guy in the ditch got a Black Lives Matter t-shirt on. The first guy that comes by is also Black Lives Matter. Next guy that comes by is also Black Lives Matter. The third guy that comes by is a ardent Trump supporter. He's the one who becomes the neighbor. Or it's a Black Lives Matter one the guy that comes by and he reaches out and helps the guy with a MAGA shirt on. The, the nature of loving those who are unlike us, the nature of those, of, of our love for one another that should extend beyond the mere surface realities of not just skin color or ethnicity, but of, of opinion. Recent surveys show that the vast majority or a significant majority of Republicans have a horrible view of Democrats and vice versa. It's almost a mirror image of each other. There's just a very unfavorable view across the aisle toward one another. This is nuts. 
This is craziness. In my home when I grew up, dad believed that all Democrats also drove Chevrolets. And so he drove a Ford and, <laughs> and all that kind of thing. But it was, it was, it was funny. It was playful. Not so much anymore. There's a harshness now. So when this passage comes to us, and it talks about love, the word for love here is a word that means love as a decision, as a cognitive act, a decision to love. It's not feeling. It's not about feeling love. It's not about feeling warm. It's not about feeling affection. It's about making a decision to love despite feelings. And we may think, well, doesn't that make us a hypocrite? As if feelings constitutes the reality of authenticity? As if doing only what we feel constitutes that which is real? Well, the reality is if all we did is act on feelings, there'd be a lot of dead people out there. There'd be a lot of injured people out there that are not. We don't act on the basis merely of feelings. We act on the basis of what is the right thing to do. So the Apostle Paul teaches us that the love with which we love others is an act, a choice, that sometimes goes above and beyond what we feel, even what we think, so that we step forward and act with love in spite of everything, in spite of everything that, that we might put on that person. And it's a practice, it's a discipline. Let's face it, the things that come naturally require no discipline whatsoever. We would just act out, we do what we feel. The things that are not natural take work, take a decision, take discipline. We have to train ourselves in righteousness, as the Apostle Paul says. We, we have to exercise restraint. We have to exercise not just restraint when those harsh feelings emerge, but then we have to exercise choice that treats people in a different way, that doesn't react when slapped on one cheek that we respond by slapping on the other cheek. We restrain and pause and do our best to act in a manner that is redemptive toward the other. That's tough, that's hard to do. But in that portion of Paul's text where it says, love is kind, love is not jealous or boastful, it is not arrogant or rude, Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Insert your name where it says that. George is kind. Gordon is not arrogant. Sonia is not rude. On and on. And that way we understand the nature of what God is expecting from us. And that is that we allow ourselves to be redefined, not by what we think or what we feel, but by a choice to do the right thing and a choice to try to look at others as God sees them. Do we really think that there are people out there whom God did not make, whom God does not love. However awful they are in our eyes, do we really think God has given up on them? God has consigned some 18-year-old to the pit of hell? Or that as long as that one has breath, that God is still working, God is still pursuing, God is, God is making every effort to bring that person in. If God does that, 
we as followers of our Lord are called to likewise look at others in that way. This is tough. It's hard to love. We often think it's so easy. Falling in love is so easy. You know, all of that, that excitement and all the sparks and all the stuff in the gut and everything else and can't, can't think of anything else. That's a different word for love. <laughs> it's, it's the word eros. We know what that's all about. But this word is agape. It's a word that is, is a word that comes to us because of the history of God's love. Throughout the Old Testament, God said to the people, to the people if you don't do thus and so, and if you do thus and so, I will no longer be your God. One time after another, the people violated the law of God, and God still was their God. <laughs> he loved them. He kept working on them. He kept trying. He saw them not as we see them. He saw them not as they necessarily even saw themselves. He saw them as beloved. Others, C.S. Lewis says, apart from the blessed sacrament, our neighbor is the most precious thing presented to our senses. And if we were to see the other as God intends for that other to be, we would be so overwhelmed that we'd be tempted to bow down and worship our neighbor. There's no room, no room for an attitude in the church of, of hatred toward others. Because God doesn't hate. So God's children ought not hate. And the tribalism that we have in our culture right now, let's, let's face it, the core of tribe is, is fear and hatred. The core of community is love. We're about building a community of faith. We're not about setting ourselves apart from others, but gathering others in toward that vision that we're given, that, that in the kingdom of heaven, it's from every people, tribe, nation, everyone, every tongue is to be gathered together in that multitude that is far beyond what anyone can imagine, that all day sing the glories of God. Now, even as I prepared this, and even as, as I preach it, it, it feels so, sometimes so impractical. It feels so otherworldly. It, it makes it so hard sometimes to, to see how does this really stand on the ground? How is this not just pious talk from a preacher? How does this actually make sense in the real world? And I don't really have an answer for that, except that we exercise that discipline to love. We don't know what it is that, that brings them to the place where they may act out in ways that we find absolutely unacceptable and deplorable. But what we can do is try to think about how our Lord viewed other people, even when he was hanging on the cross. As he was hanging there, looking at the very soldiers who drove the nails through his wrists into the cross. As he looked at people who cried out only a few hours earlier, crucify him, crucify him. As he looked down, he then looked up and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't get it. They have no idea what they're doing. They're not victims. They've made choices that, that are just so wrong, but forgive them anyway. That's what God does to us. He forgives us anyway. We've made choices or we've emerged out of whatever kind of family context that gave rise to us going off the rails. 
God forgives us anyway. And so, faith, hope, love abide, these three, the greatest of them is love. It is the love that keeps faith alive. It's love that keeps people hoping when they don't think they can hope anymore. It's love that enables others to be, to be embraced on the far side of, of a very dark time and a very dark place. And we've all been there. We compare to one another, it may not be as bad as what others went through, but we know the darkness. And so in the Apostles' Creed, when it says, he, had, he descended into hell, we are grateful because he knows he met us there. Because we have been there. And so we love. We're a people who are to embody the love of God, the love that Jesus shows to all of us, and act out that love as a discipline, as a work, as something that we do because we belong to our Lord and we belong to one another. And we never know, through us, through our simply doing our best to try, we never know how another's life might be transformed and how they might be brought in. Will you join me in prayer? And Lord, we don't know. We, we live this life, we do our best. But just remind us, Lord, to continue to do our best, to do the things that are right, not just acting on feelings. Our feelings drive us astray. But may we act on what we know to be right and we know to be true. May we love one another as you have first loved us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's podcast, there are a few things you can do. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. For more information, you can visit us online at www.naplescommunitychurch.org. If you happen to be visiting Naples, please drop in for our Sunday service at 10 a.m. We'd love to meet you. Thanks again for joining us. Have a fabulous day.